Welcome then to CEMUS, uh, the Center for Environment and Development Studies. I should look in the camera, not at my screen. Uh, and CEMUS is a joint center between Uppsala University and the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Uh, and CEMUS has been doing um, student-led education, outreach activities, and other collaborations for almost 30 years now. Uh, and uh, we are here uh, to celebrate Paolo Freire, uh, 100 years. Um, and the CEMUS has been... I think influenced by Paolo Freire uh, in some aspects, but I th also think maybe Simus has been doing Freirean kind of education without also knowing it. Uh, so this is really exciting that we, that you, Asril, uh, started this series and that we can also uh, connect uh, with other people that uh, know, know more about this and can share their experiences. Um, and I'm going to see if someone is at the door, so I'll, I'll hand over to you, Asril. Um, so, good evening, and uh, as mentioned earlier, um, we're very happy to join, hello Juliet, uh, to join um, people all over the world, organizations, social movements, the Landless Peasant Movement, MST in Brazil, uh, the Red, the Network, Paulo Freire, from the Northeast, the nine states in Northeast Brazil that have formed, organized this network and were in contact with them. And we have invited pretty much the whole world so that if you are there, uh, René, Eric, and Juliette, you're representing the whole world right now. Um, so the idea is to today celebrate this uh, special birthday. For many of us, the legacy of Paulo Freire is not just alive, it's vital in how we approach the world and ourselves, our teaching, our research, and our attempt to build another possible world. So a few minutes ago, I was conversing with Chico Whitaker in Sao Paulo, who made the design of the World Social Forum which reflects also the influence of Paulo Freire. So hopefully he will join us uh, in a few minutes in Sao Paulo, in, in Brazil. So um, the, the way we look, um, we conceive of the program. Uh, I'm going to read from this poster that hopefully you got. Paulo Freire and human survival in the 21st century. In the context of a severe world crisis situation signaled by climate emergency and the COVID-19 pandemic, we at CEMOS, in collaboration with various international free networks, persons, will recall and honor the critical and hopeful pedagogical legacy of Paulo Freire. Uh, do you call me well? Do you listen? Is it okay? Uh, to thank Daniel. We have organized in this respect a series of events beginning today by joining a vast celebration of his vital legacy and inspiration in all corners of the world. So I'm going to take a detour. Uh, I didn't read what I'm going to tell you. And for me, it caps encapsulates the legacy of Paulo Freire. I met former IRA prisoners in the UK. And in prison, they found the pedagogy of the oppressed. They read through and discussed it through. They came out, not everyone came out in normal conditions. They wrote a book in the same line of life experience for me, Shockingly, Abdallah, Freudian psychoanalyst in Ramallah, in prison, found pedagogy of the oppressed, and that reading gave them hope. So that's just two examples of how powerful and hopeful is this legacy. This initial event entails a conversation. So we are conversing. We are Right now, four, but other people might be joining us later on. 
the relevance of Freire's legacy to confront the critical social and educational issues of our time. This conversation will be followed by other events throughout the next weeks. So the first uh, uh, program will continue it with this kind of arrangement, like a conversation on the 30th uh, of September at a different time. Um, it will be 15, 15 to 17. If people are interested, we're flexible, we'll go beyond the time limit. We expand beyond the limits, okay? Uh, we're breaking the rules, so to speak. So on September 30th, we will continue this locally, internationally. On the 7th, Thursday, 7th of October, we will have a panel on transformative research and education. And Eric, who is there, is part of the panel. It's about 12 authors of a book that will be published by Emerald in March next year, how Freire has inspired us in terms of doing transformative research and education. The next one uh, would be on uh, a popular education and the different groups here, but internationally, uh, and this is popular education, popular political education. How do we raise the consciousness to try to change the chip from complacency, from apathy, hopelessness to engagement and action and empowerment. So this is pretty much what we are doing. Um, then we will um, start, uh, uh -huh. we will start with something unusual in academic scenes. We're going to celebrate Paulo Freire and René Leon's wife, Christine, who is German, and she's there, hopefully, he's going to get her. She is celebrating today 50 years, half the 100 years from Paulo Freire. And I want to tell you that René and Christina are an inspiration for me. I haven't met better parents. It's a lovely couple. I love them. And I'm going to play for Paulo Freire and Christina Schnabel. It is called Las Mañanitas. And in Latin America, everyone knows this song. Okay. You know, this is not professional. Christina. I know. Stort tack, Asil. I, I, I think <laughs> Paolo Freire would have loved this. Yeah. I, yeah. He would have been very happy with this. Thanks okay. a lot, Asil, really. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Have a Welcome, good night. Christina. Goodbye. Happy birthday. So maybe we can start with René. Uh, and we said about five minutes, short presentation of yourself the relevance of Paulo Freire in the 21st century. Uh, how did you meet Paulo Freire? And how is Paulo Freire reflected in your Weltanschauung, your view of the world and correspondent praxis? The floor is yours. Uh, who is beginning? I, I, are you addressing me now? Yes. Because I, oh, okay, I didn't have the... Oh, okay, okay, no problem. So my name is uh, René Leon Rosales. I am a researcher uh, connected to Stockholm University uh, and uh, a little center called the Multicultural Center, Monculturel Centrum in Bochirka in, in the greater Stockholm area. Um, my encounter with uh, Paulo Freire... The, the relevance, the relevance of Paulo Freire... Yes, I will take, I will talk, okay. yes, okay. 
So my, the first, I would say that Paulo Freire is for me a kind of a cultural heritage because my mother uh, and my father read him in the 70s. And I remember growing up and uh, seeing the books with that name in the, in the, in the bookshelves. So it's part of well, something that's always been around, but I, I hadn't actually read him uh, when I was younger. I just knew the name. Uh, but when I became a researcher these last years, I've been uh, researching on what you could, you could call a post-migrant generation, a generation of young kids born in Sweden, uh, grown up in Sweden, uh, becoming adult in Sweden, but whose parents were once upon a time migrated to Sweden, no? And I've met a post-migrant generation that is that are uh, politicizing, politicizing their experiences of marginalization, racist, tr structural discrimination, and politicizing um, and kind of developing a political subjectivity around this. No, uh, in the research I've been doing with following these movements that forming a movement that have been this organization forming a movement, social social movement that has been called in Sweden the new suburban movement, um, I encountered young people that uh, had met Paulo Freire, uh, had actually read Paulo Freire and tried to understand Paulo Freire, understand Sweden through Paulo Freire, you know? uh, and met a lot of concepts and met a lot of ideas that really talked to them. Uh, they, they, they felt that this is a book for me. You know? and I thought that this was really fascinating because for me, uh, the fact, it's not obvious, no? It's not obvious that growing up in one of the poorest suburbs in Stockholm, uh, you would encounter Paulo Freire and, 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 and find Paulo Freire in finding somewhere. But that's what's happening. That's what's happening. So I could testimony how young people from the neighborhoods here, the, the immigrants' neighborhoods have been forming reading circles, reading Pablo Freire together, and trying to use Pablo Freire in their, in, their, in their activism. So for me, Pablo Freire, the, the relevance of Pablo Freire is, is always, um, this, is, this is a testimony, you know, a testimony of the relevance of Pablo Freire. Uh, the, the, the kind of um, theoretical, the, the framework that, that he develops, it's really connected to, to, to activism for me. It's part of social movements, no? It's a pedagogy for social movements. Uh, it's a pedagogy for the oppressed in order to, to become subject. And this will always interpolate um, people that are in a mar marginalized situation, uh, I think. They will always be able to recognize something in this text. Uh, in intuitively, intuitively, they will see this is the text for me. Uh, the relevance for me as a researcher, as you were asking for, uh, Mazril, uh, I think that I've been uh, intuitively also following uh, Paulo Freire. I've been working with action research. I've been wor working with participatory research. Uh, and this is, you could connect this to Paulo Freire also, but you can also connect it to a really long tradition of, of in Sweden, uh, of folk building, no? education of the people. That is, that is anterior to Paulo Freire. And I think this is a really important point because I've been meeting a lot of activists that never read Paulo Freire, but that, that are doing Paulo Freire. They, what they do, how they organize themselves has been intuitively in this way also. No? So yeah, this is, my, this is my approach. Thank you very much. This is the first round, stay around. So, uh, Maybe we could go to Juliet in, in Deutschland, near Hamburg. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I work with um, climate change education at the moment. I'm, I'm uh, coordinating a project. And um, the, the relevance for, you, you also mentioned in the beginning, um, like the, the intersections between COVID and the climate crisis and education. I think that also really um, highlights the relevance for a, an approach that is different to um, what I'm personally encountering here, which is very instrumental. It's very, okay, we have to like get children to do certain things that are environmentally friendly, 
but completely disregarding any justice aspects and any like things that go deeper. Um, and I think um, it kind of it kind of helps and it's it's relevant for um, transforming it. Oh, okay. Um, it's kind of it's it's relevant for for transforming education in a bigger way and to to get to the roots kind of um and i'm only kind of dealing with it on top but i want to um go deeper and and, and explore kind of structural issues and i think for that it's it's really 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 relevant and really important um so that that would be my kind of uh, take on my little um, aspect of the world. I don't know. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. So you're very much at home with that. Um, like um, on the 24th of September, uh, we have organized in the whole world uh, World Action for the Climate. And even in Uppsala, we would be doing that and all over the world. So. It reflects that, and it's about, as you said, about systemic change, because the climate is reflecting a system that is warming up the world. So whatever means system change, we will discuss, we will address. So it's not just words. Eric Lincoln, your turn. Eric. And, yes. Micro. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, I hope you hear me. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, perfect. Uh, well, uh, if I start by, do you wanted to 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 start with my encounter or or no, no. <laughs> relevance? Short introduction of yourself. Then yeah. the relevance. Uh, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm. Um, I, I'm, I'm uh, working at the, as a teacher and researcher as, at the Maladonian University for for many years, you can say. And uh, actually, my my main field is uh, well change management, but it's uh, now it's innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think that's also an area where where Paulo Freire is quite relevant. Uh, uh, in many ways, but I also work with um, action research, participatory research, uh, and and uh, and participatory action research for 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 a long time, and that's also an important connection with uh, uh, Paulo Freire, I would say, uh, because uh, I, I would say that um, well, a, a background you could say is that uh, in Sweden. Uh, Freire was was uh, in the 70s uh, connected to a kind of dialogue pedagogy, you can say, and it was a kind of well a bit of a movement also in Sweden uh, uh, in in that respect. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Freire is, is rather difficult to read, I think. Uh, so uh, so it's uh, and in that not not that easy to to really pinpoint. Um, so I had a pleasure of meeting uh, you, Asril, uh, in 1981. So I would say that um, um, <laughs> since then, uh, uh, I haven't met Freire uh, personally, personally. So, so, but I, I think uh, our dialogue and our uh, dialogue about dialogues uh, have been, uh, well, maybe the most live in encounter with uh, with Paulo Freire during uh, many years then, and because there is a, you can say there is a southern Freirean tradition, but also a northern tradition, uh, focusing on dialogue, for example, in action research um, and democratic dialogues, dialogue and so on. So this has been a kind of living, living discussion for for so many years. Uh, uh, concerning what, what is uh, what is the well a dialogic uh, a dialogic uh, so say encounter with people and and also that the, the dialogue is is a way of of approaching people in a respectful way and also bringing people uh, into for example change and research processes in a participatory way and so on so. In that respect, uh, I think dialogue is uh, 
fundamental. Uh, I think that's, it's the starting point. Uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, it's, uh, it's not easy uh, and it's rather difficult to approach people in that way. And that's, um, that's uh, our living uh, dialogue, uh, Asriel, for so many years uh, uh, concerning uh, how to, to have a kind of, uh, you can say, participatory or you can say respectful uh, way of uh, approaching people in, in many ways, you can say. And uh, that's, that's, I think, is an uh, um, important way. And I, I think also, as I understand, Freire, it's, it's he's criticizing the you said, uh, Julian, the, the instrumental way of understanding education and knowledge and, and banking view and so on. So I think, uh, as I understand the knowledge uh, uh, from Freire, it's, it's more of a kind of praxis. It's connected to praxis. Uh, you can say the way people are, are you can say, uh, uh, they are well naming uh, their situation and and uh, developing their um, consciousness of the situation and the conditions they are living in and and uh, uh, are actually are trying to transform the situation. I think that's that type of understanding of what education really is is uh, is very important in in. Uh, in Freire. And I think that's, that's for, me, for me, also quite important as connection to what you ever call, you call participatory research and, and uh, participatory action research and so on. So that, I think, is a crucial uh, aspect. Eric, we will have a second round. So if you can stop there, we have Aidan and we have Per, even though we don't see them. Do you listen? Are you following us, Aidan and Per? Hello, Aidan. Hello, Aidan. Uh, Hello, I'm, I'm, I'm following, but I'm in no way uh, an expert. This is all very introductory to me. Um, I had one of the course coordinators I work with mention Paolo Freire because he's doing a master's in sociology, I think, or educational sociology. I'm not entirely sure anyway. Um, but he, um, he mentioned how he was a bit disappointed there wasn't more Paolo Freire being discussed in his current education. Uh, which inspired me to come to this. So I am very much, uh, yeah, don't know much at all, but I'm I very mean, interested where, to listen. Yes, where do you locate it right now? Uh, I'm in, in Uppsala. In Uppsala, ah, okay. Yeah, so I, I was going to come, but then I've uh, had various things on this afternoon, so I've had to zoom in instead. Fine, but great. Um, so are you familiar with Freire? Um, like, would you say that he's relevant to this century, to the crisis of the 21st century? Or are you getting acquainted with it now? I'm still getting acquainted with it now, to be yeah. honest. I wouldn't uh, have yeah. the confidence to say anything uh, one way or another. <laughs> OK. No, welcome. Welcome to, to this initial conversation. And from Eric, one short comment is that uh, Freire, one of the he's known in the world for his literacy method. And he was a professor of Portuguese. So grammar, orthography, you know, morphemes, uh, linguistics was very important for him. But then his line was uh, really how to read the world to change it, how to interpret the world, not just to explain it, to accept it, but to critically go into, like Juliet was saying in her presentation, to go deeper and in the process, you understand and get empowered and this becomes praxis, becomes transformative agency. And Rene was saying also, it's like a pedagogy for social movements. So this would be like a first round. I don't know if we have more people joining us. It, we cannot see more people right now, but uh, if you are there, let us know. <laughs> that's all. That's all the people, so we Fine. can see everybody. Good. So that's good. Um, it's a lovely first beginning. So, and we will um, continue with um, engaging more people, more organizations, 
in the next weeks. Today, we are just launching, celebrating the 100th uh, birthday of uh, Paulo Freire and so on. Um, let's think uh, almost all of us here are academics. So what can an engaged academic do trying to bring Paulo Freire to this shared space? So uh, Cristina Maruli in Athens, she said she was going to join us and she will be part of the panel on transformative research and education. She's dealing also with education, uh, sustainability education and so on in Athens. So here uh, she was editor on active learning strategies in higher education. So here I gave the input, how is Paulo Freire relevant to active learning strategies? So that's one way we can. And then Eric and uh, René, they mentioned um, participatory action research or action research. And here again, in Denmark, and Eric was there in Copenhagen, uh, we uh, published a chapter on Freire and participatory action research as part of his input in that he's more known in pedagogics, but he was also part of this tradition. And then we think more of Orlando Fasborda, also a friend who is no longer with us. His legacy is very vital, not just in Colombia, in a lot of Latin America. And then finally, there was um, a, a meeting and it became a book on intercultural dialogue. And in a way, that's what we are doing, coming from different cultures and so on. And uh, Eric mentioned the value of dialogue, dialogue as transformation, not dialogue as an abstraction. And then uh, one of the co-authors in the book, his English is not very good, but he's also today engaged in Esperanto because he thinks the imperialism of the English language should, should be criticized. So he's swimming very deep into Esperanto, and I've learned a lot about Esperanto through him. But for teachers in Spain, we wrote this little book in Spanish on university and social movements. It's exactly what I think René was using. And we speak about the absurd university that is irrelevant trying to bring sense through dialogue between university and the street and social movements. So this is one way in which engaged academics can do concrete work. So it's reflecting the inspiration of, uh, of Freire. So we can take a second round, uh, maybe Daniel, so he was very shy, just introduce Emos. <laughs> Tell us more about you and about yeah, what we are conversing tonight. Yeah, and uh, um, I think same as with its long history and also that certain things have remained the same at CMS in a good way. Um, I think the kind of basic drive or the idea or ideas that CMS started around uh, with trying to deal with all of these very difficult sometimes, sometimes not so difficult issues uh, that engage students, um, but also through education, try to create a different kind of setting or a different kind of culture within the work that you do in the planning phase of a course, for example, but also in the actual room with the students. Uh, and then for those of you who don't know CMS that much, I mean, the basic model is that you employ two students that work with coordinating a course, and then they collaborate with guest lectures and other people, people like myself, and putting together a, a university course. So I think the kind of basic starting points and things that CMS has been doing over 30 years or almost 30 years now uh, kind of captures that idea of doing something different that is more equal or engaging in the classroom. Um, and also try to do, um, I think a lot of it was also 
that having just lectures or just one teacher, you, you we wanted to do something different with the CMS education uh, from the start. But the freighter connection and then the things that we work with, uh, I mean, as I said in the beginning, it, it's less um, of a structured uh, conscious approach and more as somebody also mentioned, as a praxis of how we do things. Um, that is my very vague <laughs> connection to that. It's fine because as a reality in 30 years, of a program in this, I would say, conservative university run by students has not been easy. Mm -hmm. And there have been attacks, you know, how can students run this show? Uh, maybe Aitan is part of this uh, process. Yeah. Um, so Freire and Fassborda will say that research and education are two sides of the same coin. They are not separate. I mean, in in the conventional setting, you divide them. But in reality, you do research as you teach, you learn as you teach, you teach as you learn. And then we see, you, Samos, it uh, crystallizes the idea of being co-researcher. It's not me, the researcher, and, and the objects of my research. It's co-researchers and co-learners. We learn from each other. Here we are learning from each other. So if we go around, René, Juliette, uh, Eric, Ayman, <clears throat> this is a conversation, a lively conversation. <laughs> it's the Zoom format that makes you, you <laughs> shy. You, you don't want to interrupt people. <laughs> um. Yes, yes. I, I could uh, comment on what you said, uh, Asriel, here. I think. Uh, if you go to Sweden, I think we have a, I think popular education is is uh, is, is a basic, is, is a area where Freire has been uh, been very influential, and we have also a kind of Scandinavian and Swedish tradition, where study circles are are an important uh, way of working, to, uh, uh, for co-learning people coming together. Uh, um, in order to learn uh, certain areas or topic or, or um, and, and in, in a democratic way, you can say. Uh, and uh, so, so they manage their, their collaborative, their own uh, learning processes. Uh, and then one thing that happened also in the 70s uh, was that, uh, well, uh, participatory research was come, becoming... Uh, um, well, initiated in the 70s, and then people uh, started to to uh, to work uh, 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 with research circles. They, they used the tradition, you can say, of uh, 100 year you can say, circles, and then they say, well, we 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 do research circles where also researchers can be part of this dialogue with people. Uh, so, so it was picked up uh, in that way, and you could say, uh, as you do, uh, Asriel, that well, re study circles are actually uh, forms of of learning, uh, where many times it's it's research at the same time. I mean, people uh, learn, and if you learn, you you develop knowledge, and then then you are into actually into research also. So, so it's not so so far away between study circles and research circles, and uh, so I think that's that's uh, the interesting. And then uh, you can say, in in Sweden we have also the Swedish partic participatory action research community they have been around for um, ten years or so, and actually are are uh, are uh, have has a, a main aim uh, starting an national uh, uh, power or participatory research education, you can say, and open to anybody, you can say. Uh, but at the same time, we are trying to say, make it into PhD courses at the same time, and then invite more people than only PhD students and so on. So I think, I think that's, that's also a, a bit uh, in the Freyrian tradition, you can say, of mm -hmm. see the connection here also in, and, in, uh, uh, with what, what Freyre is trying to, trying to do also to 
open up uh, learning, uh, co-learning, uh, that also could be art history research and so on. And, uh, and here it's also a matter of how could you uh, have democratic knowledge and change processes uh, uh, connected to, 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 um, um, to, to a national educational program, you, know, you can say. So I think that's, that's, uh, that's in the tradition of, of, of Friday also. Uh, very much. Very much so, Eric. Thank you. Then we can go to Rene. We can go around in that uh, screen. <laughs> Rene, what would you like to add to this conversation? Um, well, I think I think it's yeah. It's very, I think there are, as as Eric was saying, there are clear similarities between what the proposal of Freire in a methodological aspect and the traditions that have been that have been um, developed within different social movements in Sweden, no? the, particularly the, the women's social movement and the working class social movements. And that has resulted in what we call folk building or popular education. But I think, I, I think that what Freire is articulating is, is, is not only a methodolog methodological proposal no? uh, about co-production co, co, co of knowledge. No? Uh, I think, there is a philosophy there that is that is uh, very central, um, and the discussions that the Freire develops are really, uh, in central ways, about about humanity, no, about uh, about protecting uh, our our humanity, uh, our men's uh, cleat, no, uh, and it's really clearly articulating. Um, articulating an analysis of society, saying that there are some groups in society that are, whose human, humanity is taken away. You know? There are processes in, in society uh, leading to the, to the fact that some groups are not being seen as humans, as other peoples. You know? And those are the people that, uh, that this pedagogy is for. You know? This is the pedagogy of the oppressed. And, and for me, to work in a freedom tradition is really to work with that, is trying to anal analyze, uh, make an analysis of society, saying, okay, in the context that we are today, in the context that where I'm working now, which groups are not being seen as human as others? Meaning, which group does, do not have the same rights as others? Which groups are not included? No? So for me, working with that tradition is to see, okay, we have the fact that we have so-called uh, undocumented migrants working in our restaurants and uh, or begging for money in the streets. No, those are the people that are, have no rights in society. Or we have we have people living in some neighborhoods in our cities that are stigmatized and being taken as criminal for the main fact of their the color of their their the skin and where they're living or their religion or their name. No, those are really okay. We have some serious problems there. No, so for me working with the philosophy and the methodology of Freire is about this, you know, is about, okay, these are the people that must, that must organize themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Rene. Um, if I, I don't want to abuse the, the, the micro, but in the 70s, I entered that window that Rene presented um, working with uh, Mexican Americans, and in a special environment, this neighbor, uh, Mexican American, I was shocked to see him cry. Not just tears; he cried with his whole body, like a baby crying, in pain, because he felt ugly. And something hit uh, a chord saying, this is not just about aesthetics, it's about something else. And then I went deeper, I did study on identity, on ethnic identity of Mexican Americans, and I coined the concept, this is creating new terms, new concepts, ethnic hurt. Ethnic hurt is how you are hurt by racism, by ethnic discrimination, and then how it's interiorized. Freire will speak about the internal enemy, 
the internalized enemy, where you are looking at yourself with the eyes of the oppressor, of the colonizer, and so on. So um, it can have this, um, it's very good to see it's not just a me method, not just a methodology, not just a philosophy. There was something else about Freire. Um, I was privileged to have met him, or I'm old enough to have met him. And I will take my turn about how did I meet Freire. The first time was 69 in the context of the agrarian reform in Peru, a native of Peru. And Freire was, and his team from ISIRA in Chile, the Institute for Research and Training of Peasants in the Chilean agrarian reform. So this is in Peru. And then he came to our group. We were saying, how are we going to train millions of peasants? And then he said, well, you cannot do it once to one. You cannot do it in the classroom. Use media in a dialogic way. And I said, wow. And then he left the room. And then our answer was to create peasant radio forums which were using radio, small groups, study circles, like Eric said, and this we did in five areas in Peru, it was spreading. So this is how this meeting provoked us to be creative, a system of peasant radio forums in the best project in a month was run by peasants. We were not longer needed. So for us was a sign of, uh, and the second time was in Sweden, 74. He had been in Paris in UNESCO. He was given the prize as a peace educator. And it's a very beautiful speech in that area where he says, and I'll be very short, he said, okay, you in the North, you speak about peace education point. In Brazil, in Latin America, we cannot speak about peace without justice. So for him, justice was the platform, the ground for real peace and not the peace of the conquered. So these were the two times I met him, but then we go around to Juliet near Hamburg in Deutschland. I couldn't possibly follow that. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, it, it's it's really inspiring. I'm I'm really glad glad to be also a part of this uh, conversation. And as Aidan said, um, I'm not really uh, like deep into. Um, I haven't uh, read much of him um, yet. So um, I am a bit like I wanna I wanna um, build a bit on what uh, Dania said about um, Seamus actually because I have uh, studied as Seamus. And um, <laughs> um, and that's kind of the 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 um, I don't know like the educational uh, um, yeah surroundings I come from in a way. And I think that this um, this aspect of engaging students and giving the power to students to actually shape education and giving kind of it back to the people who um, need the knowledge to to um, exist in this world and in those crises that we have is really really powerful and really important and I think that's also um, kind of the um, the idea here um, not just giving back to um, of course giving um, to the oppressed but also to um, to other people maybe who don't have a voice in I don't know, in like really strict education systems, for example. Um, so I work with students who can't really shape their curricula in a way um, to include the issues that are really passionate about, for example, environmental justice or climate change. Um, and kind of, I don't know, like building on that, like giving, giving voice and giving um, the tools, like the methodology and the philosophy to students to actually shape what they need in a way. I don't know if I'm making sense, but um, yes, that's, that's what I was kind of kind of getting out of that from my my uh, my um, yeah context here um, and kind of yeah building on on the experiences that I also had at Seamus, which was very nice uh, how you describe it, and I can definitely um, yeah uh, say that it was uh, similar for me. So yeah, 
Thank you. I, 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 I will give one example of how one student from Samos, he graduated, Huang, from Uruguay. He was living in my house. And he said, why do you go to have your coffee in court and you get this carton cups? Why do you take your cup? I've changed. When I go to have my coffee in court, I take my cup. So I changed. It's a little change. But it, it's transformative. So thanks to Samus and Juan, <laughs> you know, I changed one small bit. And when we speak about systemic change, it also goes through us. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know about your seamless connection. Ayman, just, you know, you don't need to be an expert on trade. And just, you know, <laughs> we're meeting well, here as valuable, equal human beings. Well, I, I don't really know what I can contribute. I, I can at least give you my experience. I am very new to CMUS. I have only been working with CMUS for three weeks. I'm a second year sustainable development student. So uh, I am very much uh, early on in my sort of growing knowledge. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I guess talking about CMUS, one of the things I, that inspired me to apply for a job with CMUS and to actually start working with CMUS was that student led education and that bottom-up approach um, which means that the people you know, people like me for example can shape how we learn um, because I think one of the biggest problems with education for so long is it's been very conservative and very top down um, and you know I, I much prefer this approach of you know I'm trying to sort of educate other students who are on the same level as me, essentially. Uh, and it's a, it's a really, really interesting experience that um, I'm finding is very different from the first time I was in education, which was about uh, six or seven years ago now. Okay. Thank you. So we can go around, Daniel, some, adding something to... Uh... Yeah, th there's a million different thoughts uh, and we don't have that much time, but, but I think it's also very different, or Freire could mean, very, or the praxis of Freire could mean very different things depending on the role you are in your profession. Uh, and I think also in my long uh, CMS, well, the work I've done at CMS, which was not working, I worked with a couple of courses as a student and like you were doing now, I did. But then after that I came into this uh, administrative uh, leadership role, and then trying to kind of carve out the space where others can do this important work and actually be creative and, and yeah, bring in what they feel they are passionate about, but also kind of defending that space and, and trying to navigate that. So, so it became less of being an educator or creating an educational space. It became more of being a diplomat a strategist. Yeah, and a strategist <laughs> and trying to to negotiate with power, whether it was formally or informally, uh, so others can do this important work. Uh, and I think that that it's also not so much that I know that much about Freire, but, but it was very interesting in how that changed and how a role within a university, I worked as a director of studies for too long, um, and you would think that work would be about pedagogic, so pedagogical leadership, you say in Sweden, uh, that, that is the main focus, but but it became this diplomatic power struggle kind of uh, role for a very long time. But that also meant that others could devote their time to doing the important work of uh, working with courses, for example. So so I think that is, that, that is my half short uh, reflection around this. Thank you. So we can go on, René. Um... What, yes, should, are we talking about, <laughs> what, what should I talk about? Yeah, when we are listening to each other, how um, Freire directly or indirectly has inspired um, our work. Um, so we are right now sharing views, experiences. Um, mm. You have made important connections, philosophy, methodology, the oppressed, the, the second generation, and how they're trying to make sense and then become politicized, and they read Freire in circles, and so on. So I think everyone has contributed something from the particular windows and balconies we're in. Mm. Yes, of, uh, yes. Uh, if I'm 
to add something i think mm -hmm. i think that um um i think that um there is a great need for for Freire today. I, I would say I would say uh, there is a great need because we we've seen the the effects of a, a neo, what's been called a neoliberal liberal turn in in, in our society in, in Sweden but around the world, and uh, we've seen the effects that has the privatization of of different sectors in in society. Uh, the effects that that have, have 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 had on the social tissue of society. You know, if to use those words, you know, uh, the, the, the increase class uh, divide between the have and the have nots, and we have seen how this kind of insecurity, the fact that you don't know if you would be able to to leave to leave as a uh, after you work when you retire to leave of your pensioner, or the fact that you are not sure what, what school you have to choose for your children, or you you're not you're not, you you you, uh, you have to see your house is, as an investment is creating a lot of insecurity in people most ex existentials um, uh, parts of life. No, uh, and this this has been proven, or, or this has been connected by a lot of researchers now. This kind of Structural pr systematic production of insecurity, you no, know, has been as created, um, as created kind of a, um, a a will to go back to security, you no, know, in, uh, in the population. When 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 all society, your lives are insecure, you strive for kind of the, the narrative of security, you no, know? and this has been created the, the, uh, an opening for uh, ne neoconservative and neo-reactionary and neo-fascist narratives. No? We should go back to the 50s before the, uh, how it was in the 50s. We had a secure country. We had, a, uh, we had one people. Uh, this, kind of, this kind of narrative are for me really present if you see what's going on politically in society and if you see at, uh, how people are reacting or voting, which political parties are growing, which are not growing. Uh, so for me, uh, Freire is really, could, could, could give us a lot of important tools no? uh, to, to work with actually with those people. Actually, we have people working, uh, voting against their interests. No? We have people um, in the countryside voting for parties that not, not really <laughs> thinking about them. We, are, we have, so, in order to, to achieve a greater political cons consciousness, we have to work, um, uh, for me, I see, we have to work with the, 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 the theory, the, the, the kind of thinking that Freire and, and the practice, the example that Freire is giving us, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the, the, the big challenges are there, you know? It, it's, uh, if okay. you, we are talking about climate changes, for me, it's connected to, to economic changes also, you know? Uh, what we've seen. So for me, there is a big need for this, and there is a big need to to yeah to keep on working with Freire. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Rene. Um, I will stick my spoon in the soup. Um, I think Freire is extremely urgently needed today for what Anna Arendt did when she analyzed what happened in Nazi Germany. She said people stopped thinking. And I see that phenomenon today. I see today people being led like sheep, like cows, to elect you know, crazy presidents like Trump, like Bolsonaro in Brazil. And Bolsonaro publicly has said that he will burn all of Freire's books. Daniel told me he tried to be in a program on Freire on March in the UK, and a hacker from Bolsonaro interfered. So now we ask people to register to be able not to be hacked. Um, so in a way, Freire is about thinking. We say thinking critically, but basically thinking at a time that people seem to have stopped thinking. Uh, today, uh, Steve Bannon, who was the strategist 
to get Trump to power, he speaks of cultural war, cultural warfare. He knows what he's doing. And this is basically propaganda. Imagine that Goebbels would have today, you know, this knowledge like uh, Cambridge Analytics, you know, this fancy ways to, to manipulate taste and so on and so forth, like marketing. So in that sense, I think Freire, it's needed. It's like wake up, you know, and if you're speaking about uh, climate change, you know, how come we are for two years in Forum Toriad in Uppsala and people can come by, you know, they look, it's like we are trapped in a complacency, the bubble. So how do we change the chip? And this is a big challenge. It's about democracy. We are struggling to rescue liberal and social democracy in the 21st century. So thank you much, Rene. And sorry for talking so long. Eric. Yeah, I, I will. Uh, first, I think uh, I, um, it's it's interesting also to recognize the, the kind of, um, well, similarities but differences also between the kind of northern and, and southern kind of uh, approach. I had a colleague, uh, I, we also had a dialogue for, for, for many years uh, trying to understand how we how uh, we should understand action research because uh, this type of research together with people that it, it's it's uh, and then we wrote a paper that where where we said that well the, the Scandinavian and and the and northern tradition is more a, a pragmatic tradition where you you try to collaborate and bring in all all concern in in the in the process you can say uh, uh, and and but the, the southern tradition is more of, of a critical tradition where where it's important to 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 focus on well you can say marginalized groups that where where their humanity it maybe it's not recognized as René said there uh, and I, I then you talked about bottom up for example um Julian, Julian you talked also about um, recognize needs or understand needs so of, of of students and so on so I think uh, there is a kind of a uh, lot of similarities, but also kind of differences here. And uh, I think a kind of stronger critical uh, perspective here and, and work uh, is important here. And, and looking at the systems that are, are well, producing in, in humanity, you can say, in, in, in today. I mean, the, the, the neoliberal, the market system and so on. Uh, we have schools in Sweden. I mean, we have been influenced by liberal politics. So it's uh, it's uh, you, know, you you can choose schools, but uh, it it also has uh, created more of inequality between between schools uh, at the same time. So uh, well, the, 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 there is a lot of systemic aspects here that need to be challenged here, and, and uh, that's as well. Uh, you say, Asriel, it's it's about thinking, uh, as as Freire is also. It's it's critical thinking is uh, important here also. So um, well, uh, and that that's absolutely not something for we need more of today. And um, so it's an uh, urgent thing. And uh, how how do we create such uh, say? thinking or critical li literacy and so on today. I mean, that's something we need to uh, work uh, a lot on, <laughs> I think. Uh, yeah. and, uh, uh, so then Freire's uh, legacy is important there. Uh, and uh, so hopefully we, we, all of us can, uh, can, can get support by, by, from, from Freire till still today. And, uh, Develop that in, into important movements for improving society in different ways. Well, uh, no. okay. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Um, how much time do we have? Um, zero minutes. Oh. But, but we should wrap this up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe just one word about um, Freire using dialectics and dialogue. 
he was using both. And sometimes it's difficult to understand. And he was using dialectics in the sense that René was pointing to. Uh, today, the gap between rich and poor has increased in the world and in Sweden. Sweden has been one of the most rapid accelerating gaps in, in, in Europe. So this inequality gap um, is analyzed in terms of dialectics, in terms of class analysis, in terms of some people are becoming billionaires with the pandemics and some people, many people have become very poor, excluded from the market. So that's why dialectics is important. Dialogue is more about the empathic aspect, where I can see the world through your eyes, through your shoes. So he combined both in a very uh, clever way, a very creative way. And sometimes it's difficult to understand how dialectics, but it's the same with theology of liberation. It's the same. You use dialectics to understand society, but you are still loving your neighbor like yourself, but then you want a more just society that would be socialized love, so to speak. Uh, Julian, thank you, Rene. Uh, Julian, something just we're rounding up this first dialogue, and maybe in a way it was good to have a few people because then we could uh, converse a bit deeper than triviality so just quickly um i made a little it's it's not done yet but i made a little recording of all the thoughts that you um kind of made i will share mm -hmm. that with danielle i think i have your address so yes. that you can also have that <laughs> um, just because it was so such a rich conversation so i'll i'll be sending this along if you want to thank you that. that's it that's it <laughs> <laughs> We're doing, but, but yeah, thank you. Vielen Dank. Einen. Um, I've not got much to say again. I've made some interesting notes, probably not as good as Julian's, but it's been a very interesting educational experience. Um, as I said, I've got very basic knowledge of Freire so far, but uh, I feel this has definitely improved my understanding of it. So thank you. So, this we thank everyone. And it was an, a different kind of Sunday evening. Uh, but, but we are, and, um, thank you, it was very enriching and nice to have met new faces and to see old friends like Rene and Eric and Daniel. So thank you. Yeah. And oh. then we continue in two weeks. So follow the program. I think the program will be sent to at least to you, but to more people as yep. well. Um, and and that's a Thursday and September 30th, September, 3 0 yes. at quarter past three. Quarter past three yep. until five. But if people are interested, we can continue a little bit over. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then we will also have this combination of people in a room yes. and also online. Uh, and there's three. Uh, events then coming in this series. This is the first. Yes. Yeah. Um, Three or four. It depends. Yeah. If it this depends. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Again. Thank you. And thank you. Yep. Another world is possible. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.